here in ecology. And we're going to start today by talking about a concept called symbiosis. So you might have to flip out a few times. So ecology is about studying how organisms and their ecosystem interact with each other and influence each other. And so one of the <coughs> concepts that we talk about in ecology is this concept of symbiosis. Symbiosis is when two species have a, a very close relationship and have significant impacts on each other. And so we sort of break this into three categories. Parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. <coughs> and I'm sure you've heard of one of these. Which have you heard of? Val? Yeah. Oh, have you? Yeah, I was thinking most have heard of the first one, parasitism, a parasite. What is a parasite? <coughs> Margaret? Well, hopefully sort of a, a non-objective, judgmental term. It's not always a bug either. It might be actually quite cute. Why? Sometimes it feeds off of their hosts. Yeah, a parasite is an organism <coughs> that lives in or on a host, and it actually harms them. It injures them in some way. The other organism, the parasite, benefits in some way. So in parasitism, one organism benefits, the parasite, but the other is harmed. <coughs> there are lots and lots of examples of parasites. I'll show you some pictures in a couple minutes, but you know, there's worms, tapeworms, roundworms that are parasites. And one time, when I first, uh, we first got our dog when we moved back to this area, um, I was bringing her out in the backyard and she was going to the bathroom. And um, after she went to the bathroom, I looked down to pick up the little present she left. And I noticed that on top of this little brown present that she left was a tiny little white thing moving around. So it's like a grain of rice and it was sort of moving around. And I knew then that she probably had a, a worm probably a parasitic worm in her digestive tract, because that's how these worms reproduce. Every once, their bodies are made of sections. Every once in a while, a section breaks off and comes out of the animal. And so if you have a dog, you know, they like to run around, smell each other's um, uh, waste. And if another dog was over there sniffing around and happened to get ingested, then that dog would, could get the parasite. And that's how these parasites spread from host to host. Tapeworms live inside of the digestive tract of an organism, and as the organism eats, they absorb nutrients, and they grow larger, and they reproduce. They can get so bad, they clog up all of the intestines and can kill an animal. Some types of worms can make their way into the brain and lay eggs. Some live in the liver. Some live in the lymphatic system. There's lots of different types of parasitic worms. Um, and we'll talk about some other examples in a minute. Uh, Mark? Did your dog die? No, she's fine. So as soon as I noticed that, I took a, a sample to the vet. They gave us a single pill. She took the pill and she was fine. In fact, when we got our, after she did die eventually, we got new puppies and we got um, the Chihuahua mix early. Like usually you get your dogs after whatever, eight weeks or something. We got her a little bit early. She had not yet been dewormed. Almost all puppies contract intestinal parasites after being born, almost all of them. And so part of the, you know, getting ready for a dog to go be adopted or sold to a home is they give them a deworming pill, a pill to kill those parasitic worms. So we had to give it to my dog. It wasn't done at the, at the uh, Humane Society. But she took the pill, and like within 24 hours when she went to the bathroom, it looked like a plate of fettuccine. It was just tons and tons of worms came out. Um, and that's, that's fairly common. All right. So that's 
Parasympathetic. Eduardo, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Is candy be found in like dirty water? Sometimes it's spread through water, food, waste, uh, lots of different ways. All right, there's another form of um, symbiosis that's called mutualism. In mutualism, it's another close relationship, but in this one, both organisms benefit. They both get something positive out of the relationship. <clears throat> For example, the Nile crocodile. The Nile crocodile is a ferocious predator. Um, it's a carnivore. It lives in Africa. And a uh, pretty scary animal, but it has one specific species of bird that it allows to crawl into its mouth when its mouth is open and peck around in its mouth. It doesn't eat it, just lets it happen. And it does this because this is a, a mutualistic relationship. They're both benefiting. And what do you think the little bird is, how is that benefiting from this relationship, right? It's eating the um, of that Yeah, it's eating little bits of food out of the um, out of the crocodile's teeth and out of its mouth. What's the crocodile getting out of the relationship? Abby? Yeah, clean teeth, no infections. So it's like a little automatic dental floss. And so they both benefit, so they both are have an interest in keeping this relationship. So the crocodile doesn't eat the bird, the bird doesn't hurt the crocodile, just fits food. Crocodile gets clean teeth, everyone's happy. So, like, what's the crack? Alright, so then it just goes in and then just cleans its mouth? Yep, then it, then it goes out and comes back in another time. Well, I don't know if they're thinking about and weighing out the thoughts in their mind, but they evolved an adaptation that this specific bird they don't kill because it's a benefit. Again, okay. it's about, you know, clownfish and a sea anemone. Oh, yeah. Right? You guys saw finding Nemo? Yeah. The sea anemone is, um, has stinging cells in the metal cyst that would um, sting most fish. But the clownfish is not affected by them. So it can live inside of there. What does the clownfish get? Protection, because other fish aren't going to go hunt it down when it's in the anemone, because they're going to get stung. Okay? What does the anemone get? What's that? Yeah, little bits of food and stuff that the clownfish brings in. Oh, here's the Nile crocodile. There's a tiny little, I think it's a plover. All right, the next and last type of relationship is called commensalism. And this one's a little different. One of the organisms benefits, and the other is just not really affected either way. It doesn't help it, but it doesn't hurt it either. For example, barnacles, these little um, crustaceans that attach to piers and docks. Sometimes they attach to um, whales, and they kind of hitch a ride. So they're getting a ride, they filter food out of the water, but they don't harm the whale in any way. They don't help it, but they also don't harm it. A robin building its nest in a tree. The robin gets a home and a nesting site. The tree's not really affected, though. <laughs> Told you lots of stories about my uh, fishing trips when I was in college and electro fishing, going to the fishing boat and the swim ladder. On that boat, um, we also one time, um, in our fishing, caught a bunch of lamprey. A lamprey, a lamprey is a, excuse me, a parasitic fish. These are lamprey, these black things. Uh, I thought I had a good picture of the mouth. Lamprey are parasitic fish. They have a round mouth, they have no jaw, but they have teeth that are this um, round, very sharp teeth. It suctions onto a fish. In this case, they're suctioning onto this trout. And its tongue has teeth on it as well. It basically drills a hole into the side of the fish. And as that fish bleeds, the lamprey uses its blood as their food source. And so they stay attached to it. As the fish swims through the water, the lamprey is hitching a ride, consuming the fish. They're like a leech almost, except they stay attached. Often you can catch a big fish from a lake, and you can see it has the wound. If the lamprey is not attached, it has wounds where lamprey used to be. So we caught some of these. My professor took it, he put it on his apron, in this rubber apron, um, and the, the lamprey is suctioned onto it right away, and you get know, to sort of pull it off pretty hard to get it away. How long do they stay on? Until the fish is sort of 
dying and then they'll go find a new vegetable. <clears throat> this is a goby and a shrimp. And um, they live in the same little tunnel. The shrimp builds a little burrow underground, and the goby lives in it with the shrimp. Okay? It's like a burger. Um, but the, uh, the shrimp can't see very well. And so when he leaves his little burrow to find food and whatnot, the goby goes with it. And the shrimp has very long antennae, and it keeps them in contact with the goby that's swimming nearby. The goby is scanning to be sure there are no predators around. If the goby goes back into the burrow, then the shrimp goes with it. It's sort of using that goby, sort of like a, a guide dog or something, because they can't see well, but it uses the goby to, uh, to, nap, to sense any danger. So again, they're both benefiting. Goby gets protection, wherein the, the our goby gets a place to live, right? and the, um, the shrimp gets to away from predators easier. Okay, a barnacle, this is a barnacle, it's attached to the sea turtle, but not affecting it either way. That's commensalism. This is a um, polar bear. Do you notice anything weird about it? Has it eaten its soul? Yes, it's not that it hasn't eaten, it has eaten. It has a parasitic tapeworm. So the food that this polar bear is actually consuming is being used up by this worm, and it's not getting the nutrients it needs. So it's emaciated like that. This um, type of hermit crab picks up sea anemones and puts them on top of its shell. And they sort of carry it around, and it protects this. Um, it protects the hermit crab, because predators aren't going to attack it. Um, the sea anemones get little bits of food that the hermit crab lets, lets loose. And there's lots of types of birds that live on um, mammals, cows, and other, um, other animals. And they basically pick around the fur of the mammal and eat off little insects and stuff, protecting it from parasites and ticks and stuff. And the birds get a little meal out of it. So that is an example of mutualism. Okay. Soil 
nutrients, for water, for sunlight, and by removing those competitors, you're reducing competition, so your plants are gonna get the maximum amount of those things. All right, so I'm gonna talk about this concept of succession. Let's say, for example, um, our courtyard here, the middle of the school. Let's say our school's maintenance staff got locked out of the courtyard forever. And you came back into this school in 100 years, and you looked out my window, but I, of course, was still there. Um, what do you think it's going to look like out there? Maybe something what else? And lots of plants, lots of wildlife. But what? Would it look? Would it be grass and a few shrubs like it is today? No. What do you think it might look like? A forest. Probably like a forest. If. You live out sort of in the more country parts of New Hartford. And you have a farm around your house. Obviously they plow the fields all the time and they grow their plants. What if the farmer left it, said, okay, I'm done with this field, and left it for 100 years? 100 years later, what do you think it would be? A forest. In our area would be a forest. What would it be in two years? Just soil? What, do you, what comes in first? What kind of living things? Small little plants, grasses, right? Weeds, really. Five years later, maybe there's some small bushes and stuff. Fifteen years later, maybe there's a few trees scattered around. Twenty years later, there's more trees. A hundred years later, there's more trees. So these changes over time is something we call succession. It's a gradual change of an ecosystem. And different areas have different types of succession. In our area, you guys are correct. If we left basically any ecosystem around here, eventually it would turn into a forest. But that's not true of everywhere. Some places it might be a desert, some a savanna, okay, some a swamp. It depends on the location and the, the condition. We call the very first organisms that could come into that area the pioneer community. Where have you heard about pioneers before? Social studies. Who were the pioneers? The first European settlers that started to move west. Pioneers are the first organisms to get into an area. The final stages we call climax community. Sort of the end stages. In our area, it's a forest, but it doesn't have to be a forest. Succession could even happen from bare rock. Any of you ever go hiking at like Bald Mountain? All right. At the top of Bald Mountain, it's mostly rock, right? But is there anything living on that rock? There is. What? On some parts. If you look at the rock, you may see like this white flaky stuff. It's called lichen. It's alive. That is one of the first things that can start to grow, even on bare rock. And as that lichen grows and eventually dies and breaks down, what starts to build up? Some soil. Once there's a little bit of soil, what can start to take hold? Um, not things, a little tiny bit of soil. Plants, mosses, small things. When they break down, what happens to the soil? It's thicker, and then larger plants. So over time, even bare rock can go through this process of forming ecosystem. Our area, mostly our climax to me is beech, birch, maple forest. American beech, sugar maple. And gray birch. If we look at some pictures, So here you go, you know, pioneer community, lichens and mosses and small plants, medium-sized plants eventually. 
larger trees. That's our area's climate. It even happens in ponds. Shallow ponds go through this process where they gradually fill in with sediment that builds up and eventually they can be completely filled in to form a terrestrial ecosystem like that. Does anyone have a pond at the house? Yeah. Do you have to ever dredge it out? Have you ever heard of that? Sometimes people that have a pond, they want to keep it like a certain duck, they'll bring in a piece of equipment that basically pumps out sediment from the bottom to keep it, otherwise it fills in slowly. This is the same forest after a forest fire. One year later, succession has began. We go from not much living to you know, plants starting to fill in. Some trees actually require fire in order to reproduce. Certain types of pine, the pine cones themselves are sealed so tight that only after a fire melts the resin and holds them together do they open up and release their seeds. And it's an adaptation to that species to be able to continue on even after a forest fire. All right, our last section of this is about human impacts on the environment. And humans have a lot of impacts on the Earth, on ecosystems. And unfortunately, most of them are, are negative. Um, humans are able to alter our environment more than any other species. You know, some species alter their environment quite a bit. A beaver, for example, can, through its impacts, take a stream ecosystem and transform it into a pond ecosystem. That's a pretty major impact. Humans, however, have the ability to alter things drastically, okay, by buildings and construction and things like that, mining. Um, so humans can do it at a much more significant level, and there's a lot of us. Population growth is a major factor here. How many people on here? Sir, how many? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Did we reach seven billion yet? No. Okay. Was okay. So you know, seven to eight billion people on the earth. That's a lot of people, and all those people require certain things. At minimum, they require food, water, shelter, but they also like things like cell phones and. Cars and things like that. Okay. So we can really, if we think about environmental problems, trace many of them back to the population of the earth. There's just a lot of people. And the population of the earth is continuing to increase drastically. Okay. And the more people we have, the more energy, resources we use. And we're getting, we could get to a point where the earth can't support that many. Look in your, I don't have the slide here right now, but in your notes you have a, a graph of the population, human population on Earth, over the last thousands of years. When does it start to increase radically? Yeah, you know, that's probably, um, you know, 1800s, we started off really drastic. What changed? What caused this graph to shift from sort of slow growth to this exponential growth? Medicine is the biggest one. Medical care. Some very, very important things allow people to survive. Antibiotics is a huge one. Back in the Civil War, for example, people died of relatively minor wounds. Not because the wound killed them, but because infection set in. Okay? Antibiotics allow us to um, cure a lot of that. Vaccines are huge. We vaccinate people. Millions of people used to die from diseases like smallpox, measles, different types of flu. Today they don't because we have vaccines that prevent people from getting many of those diseases. Okay? Surgical procedures, um, sanitation is huge keeping waste separate from water and food. Those are important things. So those resources that we do need, we call them natural resources. They're things that we take from the earth that we need to live, that we depend on. We split them into two categories. I know you've heard these before. Renewable and non-renewable resources. 
What are renewable resources? Abby? Yeah, things that don't get used up. Things that are replenished over time. <coughs> You have a, if you have a calculator, it's probably a solar calculator, right? It's got a little area that when <coughs> light hits it, makes electricity, which makes your calculator run. If you're using your solar calculator, does that mean there's not going to be enough for me to use? No. Are we using up more of the sun because we use our calculators? Yeah. No. The same amount of, of sunlight is going to be reaching us regardless. What are other types of renewable resources besides the sun's energy? Earth. Water. What else? It's another way we can generate electricity renewably. Wind. Wind power. Yeah, those are important ones. Wind, solar power, hydroelectric dams, which use moving water to generate electricity. These are things that are renewable. They're not used up. If I put a wind turbine to generate electricity, I'm not like using up all the wind and someday it's going to be gone. There is always wind because of natural processes on the air. Michael? Non-renewable resource, things that are not replaced. Things that get used up permanently. Such as what? Pam? Oil. Oil? Tom? Gas. Gas? Yeah. Coal? Coal? Yeah, those things we call fossil fuels. They were created Millions of years ago, when huge forests that covered the earth were buried, and they turned into these, these fossil fuels. And as we take them out of the ground and burn them, they're gone. They're not coming back. They're never coming back. So those are not renewable. Could we slowly start to refill that day? Because we've only been going years still have gasoline. Um, no, because we don't have the forests that supply those. Trees are renewable. Good question, Ken. So yeah, trees can be renewable. If you grow trees and you harvest some of them and use them for wood and so forth, you can grow more trees. Um, it has to be done in a sustainable way. So here are some examples. Wind power, hydropower, solar power, geothermal. All of these are renewable resources. Versus these, which are non-renewable. Once you use oil or coal or natural gas, it's gone. We're not done yet, so we're going to finish up here. So we can allow these resources to be last longer by these ideas of reduce, reuse, and recycle. So by reducing means we basically use less packaging. Right? We reduce how much we drive. We use more efficient appliances in our houses. Reuse is not using things that are disposable. So, you know, I bring my cup every day, you probably see it. Or I refill my water bottle every single day. I don't bring a water bottle, plastic water bottle from home. I don't buy those at home. And again, the reason is because each time you fill up a plastic or buy a plastic water bottle, it needs to be Recycling, you need to get oil out of the ground to make that plastic versus just having something reusable, which means I didn't use any additional resources to fill this bottle today. And last, if there are things that need to be disposed of, we can recycle, which basically means to turn that material into something else versus throwing something away. And that's why the recycling bins in all the rooms and at your house recycle. These are ways to allow those resources to last longer and to use less of them.